Welcome to another episode of Phantology Podcast. This is, as always, Stephen, and today I have Ben and Ryan and two of Ryan's cats on the line with us, and we're going to be reviewing the first book of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, Gardens of the Moon, by Stephen Erickson. It's good to be here. If my computer randomly shuts down, it's because my cats have figured out how to push the button to turn off my computer. <laughs> Your cats have transcended into human intelligence during the course of the podcast. Just to get more attention. <laughs> so on that note, Ryan, since your cats are generally pretty awesome, let me quickly plug our segment called Worst of the Best that we're going to do at the end of the podcast. The idea is we're going to be talking about the few small nitpicky things that we didn't like in otherwise awesome parts of the book. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to be here. Um, you know, excited to record yet another Phantology podcast with you guys. Yeah, so Ben and I have both read uh, Gardens of the Moon for the first time. Actually, that's not quite true. I read Gardens of the Moon for the first time maybe four or five years ago, and I honestly remember like three details from that first read when I just I just barely finished reading it this morning. So I, this is technically my second time, but really I'm, I'm a total newbie to the series. Ryan, on the other hand, just finished the entire series, right? I'm actually in in the middle of the 10th book. So okay. I haven't finished this uh, this 10 book series quite yet, but I have a lot more advanced understanding of, of the world as I've read a bit further. So Ben and I were just kind of talking and both of us are a little confused about what's going on. And I think that's to be expected. But as someone you just finished or are about to finish the entire series, can you give us a little bit of a primer of what we can expect going forward through the next nine books? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to preface this by saying that this series is unlike any other fantasy series I've ever read before. It's drastically different. It's not character, uh, not focused on characters. Whereas in Sanderson, I'm used to reading book by book, you know, you're following a few core characters and you get to know them very well and their thoughts and their interactions. This kind of gives you glimpses of characters. And I think that Erickson is really focusing on telling the story of the Malazan empire and the world that we are in. So there are some books that will not have any characters that you've read before or they'll just have little mentions of characters from books you've read before. And you'll just, for the first half of the book, you'll be thinking, how on earth does this relate to any of the other books that I've read? But Erickson will tie it in eventually. Um, and I think in the first book, especially, it really opens you up to kind of the scope of the series, but you know, like drinking out of a fire hose, drinking water out of a fire hose, because there's just so much to take in and it really takes, I think, a few books for you to become comfortable with what's happening. So Ben, what's your comfort level so far after reading one book? Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of different ways to engage with any book. And the way that I normally engage with books is through audiobooks and specifically like listening to audiobooks while I'm at work or maybe doing chores around the house. And I do not think that that was the best way to engage with this book because there are multiple times throughout the course of the book where I just kind of had to stop and say, I don't know anything that's going on right now. I'm going to try and catch up on some chapter summaries or do something to try and figure it out because it, it was very, like my comprehension was very low. Um, whereas other books that I've like kind of engaged with in that way, I've been able to keep track of things, but this book, no way. What if I told you that in order to make our podcasting deadline today, I listened to the last six hours of the book at 2.5 speed? <laughs> wow. I would be very impressed. Well, I'm multitasking some stuff I'm trying to do for work. <laughs> I'm excited to uh, see what your comprehension of that was like. It was, a little, it was a little rough. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you, Ben. I also listened to them on audiobook. Um, and I think, honestly, even if you read it, it will still be difficult. And to anybody who's interested in reading this series, I highly, highly, highly 
recommend following along with um, on tour.com. It's called the Malazan reread of the fallen. It's uh, done by two, um, two people read along Amanda Rudder and Bill Capo Siri. I probably butchered your name, Bill. Sorry about that. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because they start each chapter with kind of the synopsis of what happens in the, ch in the chapter. And then you'll hear Amanda's and Bill's take on it. And Bill has read the series before, so he has a lot more advanced understanding. And Amanda, this is her first time reading it, so she is just um, brand new to things, probably has a lot of the same questions as you would have the first time reading the book. Um, so pretty Bill, much our, our same dynamic here, right? You're <laughs> Bill and we're Amanda? Yeah, except Bill, I'm sure, has a much greater grasp of what's going on because he's read not only the Malazan Book of the Fallen 10 book series, he's also read uh, the Ian Esselmont books. He's read some of the novels completed by Erickson as well. So he, um, he knows the characters backwards and forwards. Let's talk about that for a bit. So Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that the series started by, so it started by Erickson and Esselmont, two longtime buddies from a D and D game that they were running, right? Or some kind of tabletop game. And they were unsatisfied with, uh, with what was available to them. So they basically created their own world. And then from that spawned all of these books, right? Yeah, that's kind of, my understanding of it as well is they they made this world for some type of role playing game. I, I don't know if it was Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or something else, but they basically created the world that their campaign took place in and they added so much depth to it that they were able to write these in depth series about the world. I don't I don't know. Um exactly what motivated them if it was just enjoyment or if they were unsatisfied if they were unsatisfied with current role-playing games i'm not sure according to wikipedia they were unsatisfied with current fantasy movies geared towards adults so they wrote this first book as a screenplay and it never got picked up and you can kind of see that in this book a little bit there's a lot of movie-esque type scenes that happen Anyway, they ended up, uh, I think Erickson then took the screenplay, turned it into a book, and tried for 10 years to get it published. And then finally, uh, I think some kind of fringe publishing group picked it up. And then from there, spawned off these nine other series, these nine other books, and the, the entire other series. Yeah, and I can tell you that if I were an editor looking at the first manuscript of a book, and I read this one, I don't know if I would pick it up because it's just so much. It's it's clearly setting up for an epic series. And I think that'd be a huge risk to take on an author who is unpublished so far. So major props to whichever editor decided to pick up Erickson. And I, I think that it's paid off. Okay, so I don't think we have any other thoughts before we actually get into the book. Let's do our little content warning. Ben, do you want to kind of tell us what kind of content we can expect from the book? Yeah. Um, so in terms of violence, I feel like this was kind of almost grimdark before grimdark was a thing. Like there were definitely some, some scenes that were pretty gruesome. Um, you had like a lot of assassins going at each other and um, a lot of blood. The very, one of the very first scenes that you're, um, kind of watching this older woman is kind of like brutally murdered by this passing soldier. Yeah. So I would say like in terms of violence, it's not like you're like super grim dark, but it, it has a lot of violence. There's a scene that I remember where a mage is basically torn limb from limb and, but by some <laughs> demon or something, <laughs> but, yeah. but you're right. It is somewhat grim dark, but it's also not super graphic. But yeah, there's there's definitely violence. I, I don't know. It's it's not as bad as some grimdark. Like it's not a Joe Abercrombie level of violence, but it's it's fairly violent. So you got to watch for that. It it is. I I mean I don't I don't consider this a spoiler, but I feel like the 
the concept of life and death in the series are very is it's very fluid so lots of people die uh some of them come back to life it's kind of like a hades in the underworld type of vibe um so i i mean i think that you see a lot of death like in the grim dark book however like i mentioned it's not as character driven so when characters do die i wasn't quite as attached to them and i i have come to kind of expect you know even if this character is dead there's a good chance we'll see them again in one form or the other in terms of sexual content there I, there was some more than like a sanderson book i would say um but again i don't think it ever got into like gritty detail like it yeah, was it's like always, it's always off camera it's like you know yeah. it's happening and uh-huh. it's part of the plot a little bit for one thing that's happening but it's yeah it's, it's never described at all yeah it's kind of like fade to dark and then swearing there's not much right i mean definitely no really uh really hard swear words that i picked up on but th- there is some but i don't think it was too bad yeah. there's occasional swearing but i i wouldn't i wouldn't think that it would um deter me at all from reading the book just because it's not very major yeah there's some kind of in-world swearing too they use the names of some of the different gods to do their swears okay so this is a really hard book to summarize i just jotted down a couple sentences that sum up the the major feel of the book and then we can talk more about plot points so spoiler tag starting now the malazan empire fraught with inner turmoil turns its sights to jerujistan the city of cities it is here that several factions, some led by gods, will clash. It takes the intervention of dragons and ascendants, but eventually the Malazans are turned away and now must deal with simmering rebellion and entirely new threats. So that is my brief summary. Notice I didn't say any character names at all. Yeah, so Stephen, how does this book compare to your kind of long-running hatred of hard-to-pronounce or hard-to-recognize names? Great, great question. I think you're just kind of trying to set me up there. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't too bad, to be honest. No. Yeah. So there he does use apostrophes in the middle of names, which is I'm never going to that's it's never acceptable to me. Yeah. Apostrophe no, I mean why? Why do you need that? <laughs> so I I didn't like that. But those were mostly for more God type and, and fringe characters. I thought the especially the majority of the main characters in this book were fine. Yeah, I I when I went to kind of read the summary, the Druzistan, the Druzistan. Are you trying to say yeah. Jerusalem? It's Dru. It's Dru. <laughs> yeah. So I had no idea that that started. Like that looked really weird to me the first time I read it. I was like, wait, hold on, what is what is that? Oh, you're talking about seeing how things are actually spelled out after listening. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that could be troublesome. I actually have the first book in a in a printed copy, and. That is a really nice resource because at the beginning and end of the book, there's like a dramatis personae, if that's how you say it, that details out the main characters and kind of who they are. And then it talks about the different gods and the houses and the and just different names and titles. So that was really helpful for me. Yeah, it's definitely, I'm, I'm sure, a good resource as you read along. If you try and read it before the book, obviously, you'll just be you won't be able to connect any of it, but I'm sure reading along, that would be an amazing resource to have a physical copy of the book. So going off characters though, one criticism I had of the book was some of the characters, just the way they're written sound the same to me. They didn't have as unique of voices as I might expect, which is understandable because he doesn't spend as much time with the individual characters, but especially like Marilio and... Relic Nam. Yeah, yeah, and Relic. Crocus. And, yeah, yeah, and, and the uh, Kal- Kalam. The, uh, Kalam, Me- Mecca. The, Ma- the Malazan assassin. They all yeah. kind of, I mean, I know they're different characters because they have different roles and they do different things, but they kind of sound the same. Like, if I didn't have their name and any plot thing attached to them, I would have the same feel as I read through all of them. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess as I've... <laughs> As I've read a bit more and become more used to the characters, I, I can definitely think of the personality of each character uh, looking back. But I mean, I, I can't really remember 
during my first read through, I don't remember thinking that it was hard to differentiate between personalities of characters. Maybe maybe that's because I was just tried trying to figure out who was who um, when I was first reading it. I could see that, and and I know you've said that some of the characters don't appear in every book, but it sounds like maybe we can expect these guys, at least some of these guys later on in future books. Oh yeah, definitely. Kind of going off that character, I think it might be cool to kind of do like a like a quick run through of like favorite character from the from the book. I can start. I really enjoyed Sari. I enjoyed her first because it was easy to keep track of her throughout kind of the book. Um, and I felt it was I really enjoyed the fact that you got to know her character through the eyes of other characters, kind of how she interact, like how other characters perceived her. And I thought that was, that doesn't happen like too often. I feel like when you're reading through books, like where you can really get to know a character by the way that they're perceived by others. Um, So kind of the way that all the bridge burners like kept on calling her recruit the whole time and it made them, and she made them uncomfortable because she was like, we as the kind of readers knew from it from early on that she was like this innocent fisher girl that was kind of possessed by i don't know cotillion a, yeah cotillion like a demon goddess the rope <laughs> definitely a god it, it, he is an ascendant also yeah i guess he's also kind of a god the patron god of assassins yeah and he's dancer right so he, i picked up enough to know that and I'll, I read the tour rereads, so I picked up on some <laughs> things there too. But uh, the emperor and his right hand man, who's dancer, were they were killed at the very beginning of the book, and they have ascended or returned or something, and so they are the lord and right hand man of House Shadow. So that's who you're seeing possessing Sari. Okay, so yeah, I I like that kind of that part of her story. And then I like that she was kind of protected by that um, that witch or whoever, like kind of was killed right in front of her, but ended up shielding her sh- soul. Yeah, I don't remember the name there, but just kind of like this hag witch woman. Yeah. yeah. But I, and then I like that she like the whole like kind of how it ended. She was going off with oh, what's his name? The kind of Cro- Crocus. Cro- yeah. Cro- yeah. She was kind of going off with Crocus, and they were kind of. I'm going to make their way in the world with each other. And Crocus is I, crushing on her. Yeah, exactly. I, and she was kind of crushing on Crocus too, if we're being honest. Um, but, so. I mean, like you said, you, you talked about how he reveals characters through the eyes of others. So once Sari renamed herself. Absalar. Absalar, yes. Thank you, Ryan. Which is the same name as like the Lord of Thieves. So once she renamed herself, then you saw her through Crocus's eyes and you had a lot of empathy for her as she was, you know, trying to figure out this split personality thing and just completely out of sorts. Yeah. 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 I think that was probably the best, uh, my favorite character throughout it. She had a lot going on, um, but was very easy to keep track of throughout the whole. I think my favorite character was Kruppa. Yeah. Kruppa. Kruppa You either love him or you hate him. Yeah. (laughs) I, So I told you that I read this a while back and one of the few things that I remembered was that Kruppa had some kind of secret identity. And so the whole time in this reread, I was like, wait, there's something about Kruppa. And so he's the eel, right? We don't really know exactly what that is even, but it's some kind of like spy master. I don't, I have no idea what his motivations are. He seemed to be very interested in keeping our band of heroes alive and somewhat pretty good guy, but, yeah, anyway, I really liked him. I thought he was funny. There, Erickson does a really good job of writing humor into his writing, so there's some really serious things going on, and it's it's dark a lot of the times, but then there's like these dark humor moments, and, and Kreppa's dialogue brings that in quite a lot. Yeah, he kind of plays the fool, but he's he's a lot more than he appears. Yeah, last, last week when we did um, the Words of Radiance podcast, we talked a lot about like the humor, and I was actually thinking about Kruppa when we were doing that podcast and about how he was like humor done really well. So I, I agree with that. He's another one where I think Erickson actually does this with all of his characters really well, where you see them through the viewpoints of other characters. So he writes third person limited really well because you see other characters who are like, oh, I noticed this fat man sleeping over here. 
And as the reader, you know that's Kreppa, and you know that he's dreaming and he's involved in other things right now in his dream Warren type thing. Mm -hmm. But the character, through the character's eyes, they don't know. So they just say, oh, there's a fat guy sleeping over here. Yeah. All right, on to my favorite character. Yeah. Let's hear it, Ryan. Okay, well, hands down, it's Anamanda Rake and Whiskey Jack. I just love those guys. Whiskey Jack is kind of the last of the old guard. You know, he, he's his soldiers recognize how great he is and how he's kind of been treated absolutely horribly by the new empress because of his loyalty to the emperor. But he still, you know, soldiers on and he's still... I, I feel like he's one of the guys who is just... I I always enjoy reading him. He always just captivated me. And then Anamander Rake, he I, I I didn't really have the best picture of Anamander Rake at the end of book one. He's still kind of mysterious. Um, but as as the series continues, you get to know him a bit better and his his past and he's he's very interesting and also captivating like Whiskey Jack. So I guess Ben and I chose two characters that we know somewhat of their backstory and motivations and ryan chose a couple of characters that we're gonna see become more awesome as the series goes on yeah i think that's a that's a good way to put it we do know that whiskey jack was previously the commander of some part of the army under the emperor like he had been the commander over dujek one arm who is currently the man i don't remember the different Name, armies and, and factions. Dujek but... One Arm used to be a sergeant under Whiskey Jack, I believe, and he was later promoted above uh, Whiskey Jack. Right. So we have a little bit of their backstory, but not enough. Anamander Rake was pretty cool for me too. I I let you take him as your favorite character because I figured <laughs> you were going to. I appreciate um, that. But he's described as this seven foot tall dark elf. Basically, is my picture. So obsidian black skin and flowing silver hair and super muscular and he's got an awesome sword that basically chains up people's souls if he kills them with it and don't forget he can transform into a freaking dragon right right and we don't i guess there's going to be more about that ryan said something about how this was his soul taken form or i I think was the word that you used so i'll look for that more yep soul taken something that's introduced in the first book but you don't necessarily know what it means until later. But it's not, if you didn't pick up on it, it's basically somebody who can transform into something else. Kind of like how Andamander Rake transforms into a dragon. That in the end with the, the battle against Raced, the jagged tyrant, right. you know that there are a few different dragons. And one of them is actually a pure-blood dragon, Silana. And then the other ones are soul taken dragons. Is Solana the red dragon? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so the others we're assuming are maybe other of the uh, what's the name of his race again? Tistandi. Yeah. So are, are the other other Tistandi transformed into dragons? Um, some of them are soul taken. Yes, who can who can transform into dragons? And raced, I think, took down a couple of dragons. I guess we don't know if they died or not, but that was yeah, that was a pretty I, cool battle. I don't know that he killed any, but he did knock them out of the fight. So let's keep on talking about that. I thought the action overall was really good. Ben, what was your impression? Yeah, I thought that, um, especially like some of the rooftop like assassination scenes were really enjoyable. And the fact that like, it would kind of switch viewpoints pretty quickly throughout some of those scenes, I feel like. Like you would have somebody fire a crossbow and then like, somebody else would like lean over to get a coin and it was it was just kind of like you you could picture the action scene um really well i feel like in a sea of like nebulous world building the action scenes were like anchors that you're like that you could really picture couldn't you kind of see dungeons and dragons happening in these action scenes yeah like roll for luck or whatever you know yeah lots of rolls for luck crocus rolls in that 20 every time on luck And it's cool that there's reasons for it. You know what I mean? Ryan, can we expect the action to continue to be this compelling? Yeah, I think I think you definitely can. Some books have a little bit less action than others, but 
I, I think Erickson loves the, like the military side of things. Um, and so obviously a lot of his books take place from the perspective of military. I don't, I don't know, like a unit and then a platoon or I forget what he calls them. And so obviously in, in military related books, you do have a lot of good action. So does that mean we can expect more large scale war? Because this was pretty much on the small scale. Even the final conflict was just happening in the city streets. I don't, I don't know what necessarily what you mean by large scale war. Do you mean like multiple battles taking place simultaneously? More like, do we have Lord of the Rings scale army clashes? Yes, you do. I, I wouldn't say that it's quite as good as Lord of the Rings because I mean, Lord of the Rings is just amazing but I, I do think it's similar scale. Nice. Excited to read about that. I guess one comparison between Lord of the Rings and these books, Lord of the Rings is very black and white, good and evil, but this book is super gray. You get viewpoints from every different way of all the different characters and, and all the different factions, but none of them seem to be good or evil. Like the Malazan Empire, you see motivations on those sides. Maybe the Empress is somewhat evil so i guess some of the gods especially maybe like the gods of death and shadow those guys seem a little more evil but even then you kind of see what they're all trying to do some of them are a little less interested in in human life but i don't know if that uh, you almost kind of question if that even makes them evil or not yeah i would definitely when reading this be hesitant to place a label of good or evil on pretty much anybody I remember in the first few books, I had people labeled pretty clearly as evil. And later on, I was, there were some things that call into question, you know, like, well, is this person really evil? Maybe they're a bit more tragic than I had originally assumed. Yeah, I feel like one person, well, I feel like there's a few people that I could like say pretty confidently are are good. Like, for example, Whiskey Jack or Crocus or Sorry, like at least now. I feel like they're all pretty like just kind of trying to do the best, like do their best for people around them and for themselves. I feel like when it gets kind of to the larger conflict, then it gets to be a little bit more black and white. Agreed. So most of the mortal people you're saying seem to be fairly yeah. good. One character for me that was kind of in between was Lauren, the adjunct. And Erickson wrote her in kind of a cool way where she had her Lauren personality who seemed to be more of just like a, I mean, she wasn't very old. She's probably like 20-ish was, was my understanding. And then the adjunct personality was very much like empire above all else and willing to sacrifice and kill people. And so she was dueling between these two, th these two motivations. And eventually she went with the adjunct side and was killed. I guess, I, I assume she's dead. I mean, she did not immediately come back and she didn't go into any warrens. So I'm taking that as dead. Maybe Ryan don't tell us if she's dead or not, but my prediction is she is done for. Yeah, that's kind of one of those deaths that you hope stay but dead. Otherwise, it kind of will cheapen death as a consequence throughout the series. Although, on the other hand, you didn't get much of her backstory. So one of the confusing things for me was you didn't know why she was serving the Empire. You did get that she was, when she was really young, her, her quarter of the city, the mouse quarter, was destroyed by Tattersail and a bunch of other mages and her parents were killed and then she was taken by the empire but i don't know why she was like she's really young but she's serving as the adjunct which seems like a really high role in the empire so her motivations are a little bit in question for me and because of that i can see her maybe coming back and that getting explained yeah i feel like though well i guess ryan would be too much of a spoiler to say if there are not maybe not even time travel, but different time periods explorer in the book. Like, do we ever go back before the first book? Well, we've seen yeah. that already in this book. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely um, different books will cover different periods of time. And so certain books will start maybe before the events of the first book. And then later on, they'll come into, they'll come to the present time. So it is something that you always need to be aware of is what time 
is this. And I think it's most confusing probably in the beginning of books. Okay, so we'll watch for that. Would you say that there's like, obviously this book had a pretty steep learning curve. Would you say like that that learning curve exists in all the books? Not as steep, but I, I will say that there are some other books that do also have steep learning curves with the characters. And we like to say, we, we like to say learning curve because we all took some lectures from Sanderson where he talks about writing and his philosophy in general and then some of his books. But one thing he likes to talk about is the learning curves in books. So he drew a plot of like complexity and time on different books. And several of them were, you know, you kind of start low and then you build up. And he said his Stormlight books were more steep. And I think we'd all agree with that. And then he said the very steepest of books. And he starts at the bottom and draws like a vertical line up and then goes from there. He's like, okay, this is, these are the Malazan books. And at that time, <laughs> none of us had read them, but that always stuck in our, in our minds. Yeah. 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 And I think as, as fans of epic fantasy, I think we're used to uh, a little bit steeper learning curves just because in addition to learning the characters and their motivations and their backstory, you're also trying to figure out the world and the magic in the world. Um, and so I think epic fantasy is a bit steeper than, you know, just a, a generic novel or uh, fiction. Um, and then Malazan is on the very steep end of an already kind of steeper learning curve. That's just because nerds are smarter than regular people, right? Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> or we just have much more time that we can devote to this. Um, come, on, come on, our ACT scores are all higher than the average, right? We're smart. <laughs> that i guess that's the that's the way we measure act i, I don't know steven what what score did you get on the act huh not relevant <laughs> but if you want to talk more about it we can chat about that on our discord server <laughs> <laughs> so obviously malazan book uh, the malazan series it it's fantasy but it's not very character driven it's more wor world driven and so for example like when this was written in 1990 1991 this could have been the way that fantasy kind of went, right? Like it could, like all fantasy could have ended up like this, but it didn't. It kind of ended up being more, we follow characters along their path to greatness and experience the world through their eyes. I would say it's the majority of fantasy books that we read. So would we consider this still super like in the genre of fantasy or is it kind of like carving out its own middle? So your question is why didn't all fantasy books go in this direction? Because yeah. the series is really successful. Yeah, that's true. But like, I guess that's another question. Like, why, why is this kind of a standalone series that is so successful that hasn't really gotten many copycats? I think that there definitely is a niche for this book. Because even when I talk to people who read epic fantasy, and I mention I'm reading, I'm currently reading the Malazan Book of the Fallen, most of them don't know, they've never heard of that series. And I think that it's when reading this series, it's a different type of payoff than when you're reading a normal fantasy series and you're, the character just overcomes some huge obst obstacle or they do something awesome and you're like, wow, this is, this is awesome. That's why I'm reading it. I think that in the Malazan series, it's a different type of payoff. And I'm trying to think exactly what the payoff is for me i think it's more watching like the progression of groups of characters perhaps you you're following so many different characters and they're all changing um in such different ways um i think it's, it's interesting to see kind of the change overall and how it's affecting the world or how the world is affecting their change i don't know what do you guys think for me, I expect the payoff in future books to be when I'm able to piece things together and say, oh, this is what that character meant way back in book one when they said this and we never understood. Those types of things. I, I really like those types of things. Yeah, I, I could see that. And once again, rereading the, the Malazan reread of The Fallen on Tor.com, Bill and Amanda will help you recognize more of those moments i wonder if i'm cheating like my personal quest through malazan am, am i doing it uh with enough integrity if i'm reading the the reread or do i need to come up with those things on my own i mean it's personal i <laughs> i i personally 
you get a lot more out of the books. And so I enjoy it a lot more when reading along with the reread. I don't use the reread anywhere near as much as I used to just because I have a better grasp on the world and the characters. But I could definitely see some purists saying, I need to figure this out on my own. Well, is it is it kind of a condemnation of the writing to think that you need kind of a read along to guide you through it? Or is it just like complex, like it's going to be complex and that's not, that's not a bad thing. It's just up to you to devote enough time to figure it out. I guess, I mean, like, like I said earlier, it's, it's a unique niche in fantasy where I, I, it's an interesting point. I I don't think it's a condemnation of the writing because I think it's intentional. I, I don't think that he's, he's just he's trying to make an easy to read book that just ends up being impossible to follow i think it's more it's it's very intentional by steven erickson and and utilizing the reread is kind of like using like a study guide for a test like you could probably figure it all out on your own but it would take a lot longer so it's like back in the day when i would read great illustrated classics (laughs) and you would read spark notes or something yeah, Spark Notes. Well, Great Illustrated Classics is the version of books where every other page there's a picture. And then, oh. it's, yeah, yeah. I think I read, uh, well, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the book with Kip or what's his face? Uh, the really boring one. Great Expectations. Oh, great. Gosh, you yeah. Go. I did not read that book. I'm sorry. Ninth grade See, English class. I had figured out audiobooks even at a young age. So it would be like during summer, it would just be like, droning on with great expectations in my ear no way back when you were 14 and 15 you were reading audiobooks oh yeah yeah it was like we would get like big old like cassette cassette things like oh and you put in your walkman and everything well in the car not that old (laughs) (laughs) no see i remember audiobooks with cassettes though that was definitely a thing i remember in college you and josh would always fall asleep to harry potter that's yeah that's still a thing (laughs) that's still a thing (laughs) yeah I fall asleep to audiobooks. That's what I do every night. I've fallen asleep to Gardens of the Moon for the past two weeks. Yeah, when <laughs> when uh when apps finally started playing sleep timers, it was much easier to to keep track of your position. The the danger is if you get so into it and you forget to tell Alexa to put the sleep timer on, then there's a chance that you wake up at three in the morning and some big reveal has happened in the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened to me as well. Yeah. I can think back to moments where i wake up and i'm like oh no pause the audiobook you know what um black prism not i'm not gonna spoil anything but there's a moment that you find out when there's a character that's actually a different character and that was actually how that reveal like happened for me oh no <laughs> like two in the morning uh just just call it a dream <laughs> yeah just like that didn't actually happen right? back to our previous discussion i did want to say how much do you guys think that these books influenced Sanderson's Stormlight Archive. And when I say that, maybe not Sanderson directly, but in, in, in Tor's acceptance of such a long series, right? Like perhaps they looked back at Miles on and said, look, we've seen success here. This is a 10 book series with a lot of complexity. We know that people will read it. And I wonder if that kind of helped Sanderson sign off on his books. Cause I know that he had trouble initially getting to where he is now like there's no way that they would have signed him on for the uh the journey that is stormlight archive right off the bat it's it's an interesting question because um with with erickson this is his first book right off the bat and he's picked up um by a publisher obviously it took him a long time whereas sanderson we've we've all been ben steven and i have all attended his class and he he's explained that he pitched the words of radiance uh or sorry the way of kings stormlight archive to um tor like right on the heels of one of his big successes and so they were kind of just like oh yeah like just keep the success rolling in and you can do whatever you want and then when he actually like gave them the manuscript and they realized how big it was, they were like, uh, wait a second here. Uh, do you guys remember that? Yeah, he, he for sure leveraged his other successes to make Storm. I guess my, my question is, how does this compare? It's interesting because on the one hand, you have 
10 books and each chapter starts with an obscure epigraph thing and there is a whole nother story going on behind the scenes and as a reader of Malazan I can understand the surface story and say I don't care about the gods necessarily and as a reader of Stormlight I can say I can understand the surface story and I don't care about the Cosmere so I see a lot of relations but maybe in Malazan you have to be a little more into the undercurrents of the backstory what do you think Ryan? Yeah I could agree with that I think that um, reading the the little epigraphs at the beginning of Stormlight Archive, I could mostly figure out what they were talking about or who was writing them, especially at the end of the book. You could you could look back at those and think, oh, like I recognize within this context what it means. But the epigraphs in Malazan are much more obscure and not as central to the plot, I think. Um, and so honestly, I, I don't understand a lot of them and I, I don't really look back at them and try and figure out what they mean. I think that the wheel of time probably did a lot more for Stormlight Archive than Malzahn, right? Like reading Stormlight feels a lot more like wheel of time, but I think it has the added complexity of Malzahn, if that makes sense. Like, like it has the characters of wheel of time with the kind of, ability to go as deep as you would no i don't know i mean i i would you're kind of saying that uh stormlight archive is a bit more complex than wheel of time and i don't i don't necessarily know if i would agree with that i think they're probably on similar levels of complexity but when you factor in the cosmere and everything else that's going on maybe that's what ben's saying Ben's like, oh yeah, that is what I was saying. No, so I was more, <laughs> you know, maybe it's like I similarly rushed through a wheel of time, read that series very quickly, and so maybe I just didn't experience the added complexity of it. It was more like, oh, like let's just follow, like the two rivers people through their meanderings through this fourteen book series or whatever. So anyway. Sounds like you really got into Wheel of Time. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't necessarily uh, thought of a thought like of the similarities between the Cosmere and this world of this world of Malazan because I mean they have lots like in Esselma obviously has his own series within the same world, you know, whereas the Cosmere is like within a universe or um, like the Malazan series are kind of contained within different parts of the world. So do we think that having that complexity there is necessary for these long epic fantasy books to really be successful? No, but that's what this brand is. That's what the, that's what the Malazan brand is. Right. And maybe that's where it's found success. Fair but I, I agree. I don't think it needed to be as complex to tell a good story. And here's my take on this a little bit. I don't think that it's necessarily as complex as everyone says. I know Sanderson drew the huge learning curve and I know in all in the tour rereads, they just drool about the complexity and everything, but I'm reading through it. I, I listened to it and then I read the tour rereads and I kind of looked in the front and the back of the book and got a sense of things. I feel like I kind of understand where everyone lines up and sure I've only read one book. So maybe this is a little arrogant, but I feel like the complexity is a little overrated. Ooh. First hot take of the, of the podcast. Yeah. I would disagree with that. I think that it's justified and given Ben's um Ben's <laughs> reaction, he he doesn't necessarily know half of what happened. And I think <laughs> <laughs> Well, I did I also did not score nearly as well as Steven Dunn the MVP. So Okay. All right. We'll have to if if you guys want to hear what we all scored on the ACT, <laughs> be sure to join our Discord after this. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a good topic. <laughs> no I, I i i disagree steven i think that the complexity is justified i think that is um i would agree with it i had much lower comprehension of the book and the goings on going ons um especially like the undertones of the gods and things like that that i'm that i'm used to in my typical fantasy Okay, we'll see if I get humbled through the next <laughs> nine books. So it's interesting that in all of our discussion, we barely even talked about the plot. So let's briefly just hit on one favorite scene from each of us. Yeah, so I think my favorite scene was um, the scene where Crocus 
originally finds his lucky coin and he's also kind of inadvertently dodging assassination and then he's alerted to the fact that he's trying to be killed and so he's kind of like running along the rooftops and kind of um using these hidden like laundry lines that he can swing off of and i thought that was really engaging i thought it kind of teed off an interesting plot line for him um so that was probably my favorite scene i was sure that i I knew you were going to talk about crocus but i was sure it was going to involve shalice diarl right the the lovely maiden that's always your go-to you'd be wrong in that assumption (laughs) steven all right well i have i think my favorite scene is kind of when Anamanda Rake unveils his full power and basically just transforms into this huge dragon and fights that demon. That was pretty epic. Definitely. And we talked about how awesome the action was. That was the the cultivation, the climax of everything, right? So I also enjoyed that. But my favorite scene was at the feet party. Um, it was just fun to see all of the characters kind of come together and they're all observing. You get everyone's viewpoint on this party and there's so much simmering tension. Erickson does a great job of building up tension and you know, a lot of things are about to all come to head. It was, it was very engaging for me just because of how excited I was to see what was finally going to happen. So the party, that was my scene. And in that scene where that's where Ralik Nam challenges uh, Turban Orr to a duel, and then Turban Orr is just like talking himself up, and then Ralik Nam just like kills him in one move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Turban Orr got yeah. He did not stand a chance. That was that was pretty satisfying because I hated that guy. It was also cool to see Rake just say, "Okay, sure, I'll be the second. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, "Oh crap." Yeah, they're like, "Who's this guy?" But he's seven feet tall and has a <laughs> sword. The yeah. That was a good scene. Okay, one other thing I wanted to hit on was what, maybe this is just for me and Ben, what unanswered questions or what things do we want to see going forward in the series? So a few for me, I would like to see more about how the Warrens work. We get a little bit of this. I know there's different Warrens. There's some Elder Warrens. You see Quick Ben traveling the Warrens and you see magic access and there's different kinds coming from different Warrens, but it's all really nebulous and and I don't understand it, and I'd like to know more. So I'm, I'm sure we'll get more of that in future books. I have a couple more, but Ben, did you have any that came to mind? Yeah, I would like to see Perrin, and I would hope that he struggles, because he was kind of um, influenced by, is it Open? Opan? Opan. Right. I feel like he have got out of that jam. At least it appears like he got out of it relatively unscathed. And I would kind of hope that First of all, we see more of him and more character development, but also more lasting kind of influences from Opal. I could tell you guys one thing that I wanted to find out when I f- finished book one. Is it about Rake again? No, it's <laughs> not. It was, what the heck is this Azath house? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There's this house built out of roots. Like it's, it's something to do with the earth is, is coming to fruition. And at the end, our favorite assassin, Ralik, goes into it for some unknown reason. And yeah, and, and we know that there are others. And the Tisandi, right? Is that the name of the, the Tisandi? Yeah, we know that Tisandi people are saying, should we destroy this? And they decide not to. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, big mystery. Yeah, and not to mention that it's powerful enough to trap the the jagged ty- jagged tyrant who was facing down five dragons. Yeah. Where did it even come from? Do we know where it came from? The Azath house? Yeah. Well, it formed from the thinnest. Okay, the little acorn that the adjunct took from the tyrant lair? Yes. Mm. Okay. I'm wondering if it has something to do with the goddess of earth, Burn, because the the tyrant guy like shot some kind of bolts of power down into her and said something about like should i awaken her and i believe every every chapter or, or the chapters with year markers started by like some number of years since burns sleep mm-hmm. i think i think that's right so there's something going on here with the goddess of earth so you know, i don't know it could be related interesting thing. <laughs> 
Nice poker we'll see phaser. if it's any better than my cult Dalinar. Dalinar's wife was cultivation theory that I shared in our Word of, Words of Radiance podcast. I'll have to go back and listen to that one. Yeah, if you haven't listened, that was a that was a really popular podcast. One other question I had, well, two other questions was, I want more info on Rake and Kaladin Brood, and I'm excited to see what happens with Tattersail slash Silver Fox, I think is her new name and her new body. She's like very quickly growing, and she has this connection to Perrin still, so something's going to happen there. I do, well, that was one thing that I remembered from my first read was that Tattersail died, but I completely forgot that she came back to life. Any other ones for you, Ben? Honestly, they say that like the questions that you have indicate how well you understand something. So the fact that I don't have any questions indicates that I didn't really understand it very well. So I'm just going to say no, I don't have any other questions. Okay, Ben's <laughs> satisfied with his read and he's excited to hear more. Okay, so let's close with our worst of the best segment. We started this segment in the last podcast. And the idea here is there are a lot of awesome scenes and themes, et cetera, from the book, but there were also some little things that kind of nagged at us that we didn't like quite as much. So those are our worst of the best. Who would like to start? Um, I will. So like I said at the beginning, I think my favorite kind of character to follow was Sari. And it always nagged me that such an important event happened that happened right at the start which is when this kind of unnamed character kind of sacrificed herself in order to protect sorry's immortal soul um and the fact that we don't really didn't really know anything about that or why that witch was willing to do that for sorry kind of um irked at me the whole time and i felt like it made one of my favorite characters just very hard to understand like why this was all happening for so that was kind of my worst of the best i guess i didn't really completely understand that scene because as you said that i that's not how i understood it i just understood that the witch died and there was some connection between her and sari and then for some reason cotillion and animas I th- is that the name aminas something like that yeah aminas yeah so they decided to use sari as a pawn for some reason i didn't i didn't take that as the witch sacrificing herself well i feel like the witch said something to sorry along the lines of your soul is going to be protected by me or something like that Hmm. um like i will shield your soul something to that effect are we going to get more of that ryan i'm trying to remember i thought that there was at some point in the book where they were kind of looking at at sorry and they realized that there was some sort of shield that was that was helping sorry kind of protect herself from like the horrors that cotillion was enacting through her um but to be honest i don't have the best understanding of that i need to go back and look at it okay so valid worst of this because none of us completely understand it <laughs> ryan do you have one yes i have one um it's when Ralik Nam figures out that uh, this assassin Ocelot has been contracted to assassinate his friend uh, Cole, and he decides he's gonna show down. He's gonna he's gonna have to find this assassin before this assassin finds his friend. And it's a pretty cool scene where he ends up defeating the assass- the Ocelot, but the way he does it is he coats himself in this. Uh, powder and he's like he doesn't really have any idea what he, it does but he's like you know what i'm gonna coat myself head to toe in this mystery powder and see what it's, happens it's the same <laughs> stuff that powers the adjunct sword right it's like the magic eating power yes it, so it's it's like a material it, the adjunct sword is made out of this material called otaril Ode, 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 mm-hmm. yeah and and Ralik Nam ends up coating himself in a powderized form of Odataro. And this is the worst because? Just because I, I didn't, uh, in his situation, I don't know that I would be like, I don't know what this powder does, so I'm going to rub it all over myself and hope for the best. <laughs> it's just a, it's a little bit of a strange uh, action by him in an otherwise cool scene. Yeah, he's a pretty smart character, but in this case, maybe a little out of character to just say "Eh, i don't know what to do so here we go magic yeah okay mine was 
I know the ending was awesome, but I don't think the ending climactic scene was quite as uh, as framed out as maybe a Sanderson avalanche towards the end of the end of the book because there were a few things that happened, but I thought especially the battle between Rake and the demon that uh, mm, what's his face the Malazan guy summoned. Uh, Tashrin. Yeah, the the battle between Rake and Tashrin's demon that was unleashed kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, I know there was a demon that Quick Ben released earlier, so it wasn't a new plot device. But I wanted to see more of a showdown between the Jagged Tyrant and Rake, and I thought that was going to be driving everything. And then once that happened, there was like this sub battle that happened, and it was cool. But at the same time. Um, I, I just feel like Sanderson's climaxes are a little more tightly woven with everything that he's been hinting out through the whole book. Yeah, you do bring up an interesting point, Stephen, because Anamander Rake during this battle with the Jagged Tyrant, you're just kind of hearing about how he's really like tearing into these dragons. And Anamander Rake is just kind of casually at this party, just not really doing much. You, you just have the expectation that He's not worried because he's he's so powerful that when the the tyrant gets there, he's just gonna crush him in one punch or something like that, and it doesn't really happen that way. That that is, I mean, I don't think that's the point you were making, but it does kind of seem like Rake is a little overpowered. He's never concerned about anything. I don't think he took a hit throughout the entirety of this book, or if he did, it wasn't very serious. So I guess we'll see how he fares through the rest of the series. He did get knocked back at the Battle of Pale, if you'll remember, when he was he was taking on all of the Malazan mages, and they actually um, they actually got him to retreat. Yeah, but even then, he said he only retreated to save his moon's spawn thing, his his floating city. He was saying, "Oh, if I kept on fighting, the city with all the people would have been destroyed, so I had to stop." But it was like I could have taken him, but I you know I wanted to save the people. Yeah, but he's not powerful enough to save all of them, I guess. Fair enough. Okay, any final parting words for Malazan of Book of the Fallen, book one? I would just like to say that although on this podcast episode I was considered the expert, I am very, very far from an expert, and there's a good chance that I got some things wrong or we got some things wrong. So I would love to discuss this with other knowledgeable Malazan people on our Discord. So if you're listening, please join our Discord so that you can talk to me and correct me. And maybe you can answer some of my questions or I can answer some of your questions. My name on the Discord is Anamander Rake, obviously. No way. <laughs> would, wouldn't have guessed. And and you can find our Discord by um, going on our Twitter. It's the pinned tweet that we have there. Our Twitter is Phantology underscore books. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will catch you next time. Thanks. Thanks.